Charlotte, Charlotte, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I didn't want you to raise my hand or to put the title around my waist. I just want you to call me Queen. <laughs> Bitch. The Wrestling Life. Everybody, it's the Wrestling Life. It's episode 278, second week of September 2021. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. Uh, yes, perhaps more than ever before. And uh, as always, so many things we can't talk about right here on the first and the only wrestling podcast. That's right. Well, there was an all out pay per view this past weekend. It was. I think objectively one of the best wrestling pay-per-views of all time. Um, thoughts may vary. I still feel it was too long, but on the uh, the wrestling on the show was was pretty superb. What you think of all out? Yeah, I I don't uh, I don't disagree with anything you said. Uh, I think that it that uh, that is a uh, it's a show that contained multitudes in that had a lot of great wrestling. A, a lot of those, you know. You're going to remember where you were. You're going to remember how you felt when that thing happened on that show. It was, a, it was an eventful, newsworthy show. And yes, it was also maybe 35 minutes too long. So, <laughs> uh, you know, when, when we, it was like a half hour to midnight and uh, QT Marshall is, is just trotting out to the ring for his match, it was a little, uh, a little concerning. <laughs> Yeah, I could have done without that. By the way, Big Show has just aged to like 75 years since the last time I saw him in the ring, which was only like, I don't know, 18 months ago. Not even that long, 17 months ago. I missed his match with Orton last summer somehow, but boy, time has not been kind. Yeah, he's moving more like uh, like he did before he lost the weight, like like 20, even like when he was maybe he was in the tag team with Jericho and he was like really heavy. Sure. He can still do a couple of like short explosive things, but every time he has to like move more than I would say three steps in the ring, it's a uh, it looks like it's causing him some some discomfort at the very least. It gets dicey, but we somehow have managed to harp on the one negative from that show <laughs> already. When really people remember like one of the greatest cage matches of all time between the Young Bucks and the Lich Brothers. And the debuts of Daniel Bryan and Adam Cole, probably more than anything else. Oh, and CM Punk's return to the ring for the first time in seven and a half years. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it's that's the stuff that everyone will will truly, obviously remember. It's the QT Marshall versus Paul White will be a fun trivia note um, someday on what was the semi main on this great great show. But yes, no, it was uh, it was a great show from uh, pretty much from top to bottom. Um, I, I think there was at least stuff to like in pretty much every match on the show. Uh, the, the Kingston Amiro match, the Kojima and Moxley match, which of course also had the AEW debut of Minoru Suzuki. Uh, he followed that up with uh, you know, the women's title match. And as you said, uh, you know, I think that Bucks uh, versus Lucha Brothers cage match, that's the best match of the year, I think, by a wide margin so far. Um, I I genuinely like there's a, i can understand if there's another other matches that maybe mean more to people if you're a big fan of a certain wrestler but as like a bell to bell it was great action and it told a great story and you had a great ending and the good guys triumph it's like that was that was some really pretty picture perfect pro wrestling it's up there with walter and dragon off i'm not sure how much nxt you do or do not consume these days but at their don't watch the show paul the last takeover was uh they had the best ow match in many many moons that's fair i i will go out of my way to seek that out because i i adored their empty arena match from last year so i'm sure with a 
even a small crowd, it was probably even better. So I will, I will make a point to see that match before, uh, before the year end comes. But uh, yeah, overall, this show was just, it was just great. And, you know, CM Punk and Darby had a very more of a traditional pro wrestling match. Um, it, and in some cases it straight up, uh, you know, homaged or stole, depending on what, uh, what verb you'd like to use uh, things like Bret Hart versus one, two, three kid uh, some s- spots from some of punk's famous matches, including matches he had with Ray. And um, it was just, it was really good and it was a good finish and it felt like a big deal and punk seemed really happy. And, you know, as we all predicted seven years ago, CM Punk returned to the ring, defeated his opponent, and then shook Sting's hand just as we all drew it up. Sure, exactly. I thought it was. I thought that match was slow. Not not bad, but slow. Yeah, I think it it was definitely an example. And I don't know if we talked about this on the show or not. I think we talked about it off the air. Uh, when the Edge and Rollins SummerSlam match, uh, I think you noted that it felt like Rollins was maybe working down to Edge's level sure. as opposed to Edge coming up to his level, at least as far as a pace goes. Yeah. Um, and I think that was definitely on display here, too. I think they worked a punk paced match, which is, you've seen the matches that Darby has had with, you know, Sammy Guevara or or even like Miro or, or Cody or, or whoever, like, yeah, he can, he's one of the, you know, the quicker paced guys you're likely to see. So he, I think, especially for a Darby Allen match, it was a uh, pretty uh, glacial. But Brian Danielson's coming in, teasing a program with Kenny Omega. How do you feel about that? It's pretty exciting. Um, I think the most interesting thing out of that, um, obviously, and we've we've talked about Punk coming in before he came in, and af- now after he's come into death, the reasons why he chose AEW over the other place is, you know, he did accuse them of almost killing him due to ne- medical negligence at one point, um, and was sued over it. So, like that, that's maybe not as surprising for Punk if if Punk was going to come back to wrestling that he would choose AEW. I think what is fascinating is to see the Adam Coles and the Brian Danielsons now, and potentially other people that we'll talk about later in the show. Uh, those people who did have, do have really good things to say about their time in WWE, who do feel that they were used pretty well, who don't have this chip on their shoulder um, and got along with management. And in some cases are related to management in, uh, in Danielson's case, and yet they still looked at AEW and said, I think that would be better. Like, that's, that's a real, like, to me, that's, that's a great feather in AEW's cap to go. People are coming here not so much because the other place sucks, uh, but because we're, because to the outsider, this looks like the place to be. Like, that's really exciting if you're, if you're in AEW or if you're a fan of what AEW has been doing. I think some of that speaks to, to the uncertainty or the mismanagement of WWE's talent roster, because they, they certainly have no shortage of talent. It's just for some reason, we still have John Morrison and Bobby Lashley. No (laughs) offense to those guys who are, you know, they should probably have a spot on the, on the card. And I actually think, you know, Bobby Lashley's Bobby Lashley has been booked very well, but both of those guys have been on TV for 15 years now, <laughs> you know, and yeah. it's like, and if you're, if you're Daniel Bryan or if you're Adam Cole, it's like, well, do I want to go work with Kenny Omega <laughs> or do I want to work with Bobby Lashley and John Morrison? It's like, <laughs> well, I think that's kind of a no brainer. And I guess we can talk about this now since, it's it's out there now. I had heard last week that WWE told Adam Cole, we want you to cut your hair and we're going to use you as a manager. <laughs> and he was like, all right, deuces. <laughs> <laughs> so I was not shocked that he showed up on Sunday night. I thought maybe he'd be held off until the Arthur Ashe show in a couple of weeks. But uh, it turns out we got we got both. Yeah, I think a lot of people thought it was an either or scenario. And uh, 
I don't think anyone would have blamed them for holding it off, but they chose to sort of really, I think, go for that big splash and also to do sort of a double, a, a fake out with Cole debuting immediately turning heel and siding with the heels and then seemingly like, Oh, we're going to end the show with this really heavy heat angle. Um, and then instead, Brian, you know, Danielson shows up to help the baby faces and clears the ring and sends the crowd home happy. Um, not that the crowd wasn't happy to see Adam Cole with, with the young bucks and, and with Kenny Omega, I think even, I think the crowd, AEW crowds, AEW fans are very good at playing along and booing who they're supposed to boo. And we've talked about that before. We really haven't seen a time where the crowds really turned on something. So, you know, to date, I'm sure it will happen at some point, but so, but uh, I'm sure they would have been happy enough with just the Adam Cole debut, but uh, adding in the, the icing on the cake being Brian Danielson on top of what had already been a, you know, an all time great show with a lot of great wrestling and, uh, we did, uh, we would be remiss not to mention, of course, Ruby Soho also debuting, which was like the worst, another one of those worst kept secrets, I think, uh, for, for the last couple of months that she was coming in. But, uh, that was, that was great. And you could see how much that meant to her. And even though maybe the work in that battle Royal, uh, to start to finish wasn't phenomenal, uh, to say the least. Uh, it was still, it, it didn't matter, right? Because everyone was waiting for her to come out. She came out, she got this giant reaction. It clearly meant the world to her to get that reaction. And uh, and then she and she won, unlike I think they, they have generally not done that with debuting talent. And we might have two examples of it here based on the direction for Dynamite. But the, she debuted, won the Battle Royal and is going right into the program with Brit. And then you potentially have Danielson going that same direction with Omega. So a lot of, yeah, it feels like a hot, exciting show. It felt like, and I am remiss to ever use this word because I don't think I'm young enough to know what it means anymore. But I thought at the end, I was like, that felt like a really cool show. Like that show felt cool as hell when it was over. I was like, that was, was really exciting. And, and uh, yeah, that's, it was it was a a very very fun show and it I think it's also a a good uh, bullet in the chamber against folks that are that say hey wrestling fans can never be happy it's like well turns out when you give them a lot of stuff that they want and they that they like they can be pretty happy <laughs> saw a lot of happy people saw a lot of happy tweets uh, tons of happy people in that arena um, so yeah good feel good show. Uh, I'd like to give you the floor to address your wife, Jamie Hader's uh, ring work. Yeah, it was rough week for her. <laughs> yeah, it was um, cowboy emoji. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, it was it was rough. She did not have a good showing in the Battle Royal. And then uh, based on the amount of uh, times I have seen Ruby Riot work with people that are not good wrestlers, and managed to get a pretty good match out of them. I would not blame Ruby for the (laughs) miscommunications in the dynamite match either. Um, And and at first I was like, maybe I'm being more forgiving of this because I, you know, Ruby's cool and, and I'm in love with Jamie Hayter. Both of those things could be true, Uh, (laughs) but (laughs) no, it was, it was definitely rough. And then I think that combined with Ruby didn't make a comeback in the match. She just was like, it was like awkward offense from Jamie for five minutes. And then Ruby hit the kick and won. And the yeah. crowd was just like, Oh, all right. Well, golf class yes. to that. Like yes. it was a, yeah, it was a rough follow-up to what was a great debut uh, for, for uh, Ruby and her, her and Thunder Rosa had a pretty great face off in the, in the final couple minutes there. So yep. maybe it should have put her in the ring with Riho or, or Serena Deeb, or I don't know what her health status is at the moment, but maybe uh, maybe you pick somebody that's uh, a little more seasoned, as it were. Uh, no yes. offense to yes. uh, my wife. Yes, <laughs> very nice. All right, a uh, lot of talking on Dynamite, and uh, the company still cannot time out a show to save their lives, as evidenced by cutting Minoru Suzuki's song and his entrance. And then having John Moxley wander around the arena for like seven minutes at the end of the show. And 
there was a it was a very talking heavy show and obviously you know it kind of has to be to set up where you're going to go next but my word of advice to them in the future you can't book that many live in ring in arena promos be- with people who are going to get a reaction from the crowd because then they stop and they pause and they play to the crowd so it's like shocking they c- tried to cram uh, way too much into a two-hour show and uh it was a weird show because of it not necessarily bad just really poorly timed yeah i think that's a fair critique um it wasn't as bad to me as that Wisconsin show a couple of weeks ago after Punk debuted. Like I thought that was one of the worst dynamites they'd ever put on. Yeah. Um, so, and I think the the viewership reflected that in that they tuned in for that first segment with Orange Cassidy and Matt Hardy, and then tuned out throughout the rest of the show with the exception of the Punk segment. So this week obviously didn't have those that uh, that trouble with the viewership so much, but. Uh, yeah, it, it just it did feel like it wasn't. Uh, it was it was very like angle and 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 promo heavy and yeah, like you set up some some stuff that's 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 going to be. And again, it's one of those things. I think you talked about this a couple of weeks ago. They are now constantly promoting like four different shows at once. Yes, um, because they obviously they have this bigger this huge Arthur Ashe show. It's going to be the biggest crowd in AEW history. And it's gonna, and it's you're gonna have you already announced that Cody's coming back for that show. I'm guessing there's gonna be some sort of eight man with Brian Danielson, Christian, and and uh, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy against the Elite on that show. Me, I think MJF versus Pillman was announced for that show. Not that I would think that would go too long, but I assume I'm gonna maybe think Punk is wrestling somebody on that show as well. Um. So they got a so they got a film for that. They're also you know plugging stuff for next week's dynamite, like Adam Cole's in ring debut against the elite hunter Frankie Gazarian, uh, and and whatever else. Uh, and they're plugging matches and and shooting angles for this week's rampage, which was <laughs> being taped right after after dynamite. So it's, you're, you're you're doing stuff for next week, but first you got to also do angles for Friday. Plus, you got to build to whatever your next big TV is in the, and then in a few weeks from then, you'll have to start doing early build for your pay per view in November. So it's just yeah, they're they're in this weird cycle where they where they are constantly promoting three or four different shows at once, and I think that's that's part of it too. And uh, like I said, yeah, I think there was some good stuff on the show. I liked the Punk and Taz interaction. I liked the Danielson and Elite stuff. Um, and the what we saw of the main event that wasn't uh, in picture in picture i liked um but yeah it was it was definitely i think as i think you kind of hit the nail on the head uh, it was a, it was a weird show no excalibur really hurt that show too it's like whatever you think of excalibur mm-hmm. as an announcer he's certainly competent <laughs> and and okay. and knows the names of moves and there was really just nobody directing traffic on that broadcast. Like Taz, when Taz is your best play-by-play guy out there and he knows it and he's trying to maintain order in a broadcast and you got Jim Ross and Tony just kind of meandering. Ooh, boy, that was a rough couple hours. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I think it added to the unsmoothness <laughs> of what was already, as you said, a jam packed and, and an overbooked show. But, but yeah, I mean, you appreciate it. The first thing I noticed was I think I had read a tweet. Like I started the show late as I often do. And I think I had seen a tweet that said Excalibur wasn't on the show. And then I, it dawned on me when Tony was reading the state farm uh, <laughs> ad, I was like, Oh no. <laughs> and he's like, I was like, Tony hasn't read copy in a couple of, in a couple of decades. Has he, <laughs> at least not on live television. Right. And y- you could tell. And then, yeah, you have Taz trying to point out moves and stuff, but also play his character yes. and, and then also had to shoot an angle. And like, I think everybody did their best. Like I honestly thought Jim Ross, the world's worst commentator, uh, overall between dynamite he did his best on dynamite um and then i thought uh the the pay-per-view was maybe his best night in aew like he tried it felt like he was trying his hardest to make all of these moments matter more and he was thought he was good in the cage match thought he was good in the main event uh was really good with with all of the debuts and surprises and everything 
Uh, like I thought he had a really good night on Sunday. And then it was like, whoa, this guy, even at, even at whatever you would consider his best is at this point, he's still quite limited as was on display on Wednesday. Yes. Other last AEW note, I guess, uh, Kevin Owens contract coming up in January and um, speculation rampant this week that he's the next domino to fall. Yeah, um, I think that I think that again goes back to what we were talking about with with Cole and Danielson. This is another guy who I'm sure would not consider himself disgruntled as a as a WWE performer, um, mm. but he but he might look around and he's currently in a feud with Baron Corbin and and has been has been sort of in this utility player role for a couple of years now uh, a Chris Jericho type role a Christian type role where you do nothing for months on end and then they need somebody who can cut a promo and is over to work with a top guy so you get beaten like a drum by the top guy for a couple of months and then you're back to kind of meandering in the mid card when when they're done with you um so I mean look there are worse spots to have you know <laughs> sure. but, but but uh, and I'm you know makes I'm sure he makes very good money makes a lot of merch money and all that so I'm sure there's reasons for him to feel comfortable where he is but uh, if you're and I also think for guys like Danielson and Owens and Adam Cole for that matter like I think there's that feeling that uh, as you pointed out guys in their late forties are main eventing all of these shows in WWE. Yeah. So when my two or three year contract with AEW is up, if I'm ready to kind of cash in and coast, WWE will still be there, you know? <laughs> like yeah, go, let's go have fun and make some art now while while I could still, you know, I could still maybe go and I think I could still catch up with these uh catch up with these young young guns and then in a few years I can coast on back to Florida if I feel like it. Well, and the the questions surrounding the mortality of the top WWE brass, notwithstanding, it's like Vince always has the thing where he wants you more if you've left him, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you just stay, it's like, there's no challenge in that for him. I feel like somewhere along the line, Kevin Owens got a label from Vince as either injury prone or when he decided that he um because his wife's uh grandparent or parent i think it was grandparent died from covid that he was not going to work during a pandemic for a period of time i feel like he got um tagged as a malcontent or injury prone or some combination thereof and you just know I mean, to your point, he still managed to work himself into a program with Roman Reigns for three months earlier this year because they needed somebody. But I just feel like he's he's never going to get the top guy, real top guy stuff in WWE anymore. And so, sure, you know, if the opportunity to go work with your friends. Why not? Yeah, I think I think that's that's a really good point. I, I mean, I think it, it's weird to think about now if. Kofi mania didn't happen. He was working Brian at that mania and was gonna, I assume win the belt. And when that didn't happen, they like tur- it, it again, it felt like a very Christian thing where it's like, well, we need to heal for Kofi now. Right. All right, we'll turn him summer comes up. Uh, all right, we're going to turn you back. Cause we're going to have you feud with Shane. And then <laughs> it's just, it's just, yeah, he, it feels like, okay, we keep you around you can cut a promo. You can kill a 20 minute segment on a show every week. If we need you to either with a match or with a promo. Uh, So you're a good guy to have around, but you're also like, it's a plug. Yeah. It's a plug. He's a plug and play guy. And maybe he's not, not ready to resign himself to that role for the rest of his life. Sure. All right. No real way to move on in a seamless, smooth way or a way that doesn't seem flippant, but Triple H, in very WWE speak, had a cardiac event and had a medical procedure last week. So, best wishes to him. Whatever you think of Uncle Paul, 
nobody wants anything bad to happen to him. And yeah. um, you worry about someone who has been a bodybuilder for 30 years and what they may have done to their body to be a bodybuilder for 30 years. And uh, you worry when you hear the words uh, cardiac event. And that's not very descriptive, but also it sounds like maybe it wasn't as serious as a heart attack, but something happened. And I mean, it's up to him to tell the story if and when he wants to tell the story. But I, you know, it's pretty significant when the, um, for many years, the presumed heir apparent to the biggest wrestling company in the history of the planet has a medical scare in his early 50s. Yeah, I mean, I I think uh, one of the side effects of him keeping himself in such tremendous uh, cosmetic shape, and the fact that he has been on television for you know with with very few breaks for thirty years, uh, you don't necessarily notice that. Yeah, he's he's getting older, man, and generally it's not good for for guys in their 50 to carry that weight. And I'm not, you know, I don't want to cut this come off. Like I'm blaming him. Like, Oh, you shouldn't have lifted so many weights or, you know, taking so many vitamins, brother. Um, I don't want to come off. Yeah. I don't want to come off flipping with this, but yeah, I think it's just a sign of like, wow. Yep. He's, he's getting a little bit older and hopefully it wasn't as, as serious as it could have been. You know, if the fact that they did a press release about it, I assume means that they were afraid it was going to get out. And maybe they thought if, they didn't say if they didn't announce it that it would look worse than it is. And again, yeah, hopefully he's he's fine and and will be you know will be back in uh, quote unquote fighting shape soon enough. But yeah, I think it's just one of those things where it's, it was it was definitely a, a shocking thing to see. And and yeah, you, you it it just felt like a sign of you know he's 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 not a kid anymore. And uh, and uh, yeah, wish him wish him all the best. WWE television, not a whole lot uh, notable happening on SmackDown or Raw. (laughs) They're building towards extreme rules. Uh, Roman Reigns going to wrestle Finn Balor. Roman and Finn had a really good match on TV. I don't even remember at this point if that was last week or two weeks ago. (laughs) I think it was last last week. They They had a really good match in the main event of SmackDown. Yeah, it was it was those guys historically have nothing but bangers. So I look forward to seeing them have another one. The 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 twist will be um, that uh, after he uh, choked Finn out with the guillotine, some blinky red lights occurred. Yes. signaling because it's time for lore. Yes. And, uh, the demon king is going to come back. And uh, he's going to get all painted up for his for the next match, I guess. So cool. Like those guys are going to have a great match. And Dowler hasn't done the paint gimmick in a long time. So I think that'll feel exciting and special. And uh, yeah, I bet they'll they'll have another great match that will also feature a lot of squeezing and talking. Yep. Over on Raw, we're slow burn, slow building Bob Lashley and Randy Orton. Orton and Riddle are uh, tag team champions, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe Omos is going to wrestle for the title at some point here sometime soon. Anyway, like raw was not a raw was Vince wasn't at raw. And so raw was like a, Hey, let's tease 75 things and maybe not pay any of them off. Kind of a show where they teased Omos and Lashley going at it at some point for like the second or third straight week, they tease Bobby Lashley and Randy Orton being a title match. So, you know, I think they've straight up announced Orton and Lashley now. Oh, I'm uh, on, not on, not on the show that 2 million people watch, of course, on, on dot com. I'm, uh, I'm really embarrassed now. If that is in (laughs) fact the case, I'm Uh, like 98% sure. I mean, they definitely announced the, uh, I gotta look it up now, but they definitely announced, the universal title match is official and yeah yep yep there's a graphic of randy orton and his very problematic facial hair (laughs) what is he doing with that i don't know taking on bob lashley for the wwe title damian priest and sheamus for the u.s title charlotte flair and alexa bliss boy oh boy 
and uh, Becky and Bianca. So yeah, that's, uh, that, that's some stuff, you know. That's tell you what, it's a show. It's always been a show. It's always going to be a show. It's still a it show. Is, it is very much a September WWE pay per view. <laughs> yeah, this is the. I mean, traditionally, it's the doldrums, right? From like September, mm-hmm. and we don't even have Hell in the Cell this fall because mm-hmm. they did that this summer. So it's like they they're not even going to try. You know. We're in the uh, we're in the Nick Khan era now too, where <laughs> really it's all about no effort <laughs> and and just and any of the people that are in these announced matches could be fired tomorrow for all we know. <laughs> yeah, so you know, yikes! But yeah, so we got that to look forward to. Uh, I'm going. <laughs> I'm going to see the World Wrestling Entertainment like twice in the next three weeks. I love the World Wrestling Federation. I'm going to see the a house show on Saturday night this weekend where uh, neither of my favorite wrestlers will be there because one is an anti-vaxxer and the other is a new mom. <laughs> you, the two genders. <laughs> correct. And then I'll be going to see SmackDown when they come to town in like three weeks. Oh. Provided I- that... That doesn't uh, it doesn't get canceled or moved again, right? Uh, yeah, I. So where's the house show located in? It's uh, it's in DC. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's uh, that's exciting. Um, I suppose. I, I hope at least Becky makes the TV. If uh, well, if they're they aver- they're advertising both Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks for TV. So... And they never and they never ever. <laughs> Vince McMahon's World Wrestling Federation would never advertise a star who wasn't who they knew wasn't going to be at the show. They're also advertising like Randy Orton and Bobby Lashley for that SmackDown. So oh, it's a super SmackDown. I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on. Like they're definitely going to be raw people at uh, this week's SmackDown because it's in Madison Square Garden. Um, mm-hmm. You know, not sure if if uh, her for, I've heard conflicting reports about whether or not unvaccinated wrestlers will be on that show or not. <laughs> but uh, apparently, positive co- or a positive uh, you got you got to show proof of vaccination to get it in if you're a fan. Not sure about that as a wrestler, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. incidentally, I don't think Sasha Banks is scheduled to return this Friday. I think she's scheduled to return next Friday. Ah, well. <laughs> funny how that works i'm <laughs> yeah. sure she's she's busy on a movie set or uh, doing a, 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 a youtube video where she eats chicken wings or something i'm sure yes. i'm sure there's some reason why uh, some uh, totally normal non non vaccination related reason why why sasha hasn't been on the show for the last month and a half sure uh they are so for this house show they're advertising uh it's a it's a it's both brands and uh, they have advertised no matches, but Roman Reigns, Bobby Lashley, Randy Orton, Bianca Belair are like the four names that they've advertised. So I guess we'll see. Well, there's some guys. <laughs> there's there's some guys that have always been guys, always be guys. They're still guys, you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, New Japan ran a million shows this past weekend and uh, nearly killed me. There was a lot of good wrestling on the shows. And then they revealed uh, the there were no major uh, title changes. Uh, The junior tag titles changed hands and Toro Yano got his uh, King of Pro Wrestling trophy back. But none of the major titles changed hands. They announced a very lackluster G1 lineup. And uh, that begins in about eight or nine days here. And uh, my life will be ruined for the next month. So... (laughs) Uh, a lot of good wrestling on the New Japan shows, but uh, kind of um, uh, a lot of a lot of filler. Uh, one night they had Toriano and Chase Owens wrestle for a half hour, and it almost turned me into the Joker. <laughs> but aside from that, it was a pretty good weekend of New Japan this past weekend, uh, as they ran two stadium shows and then announced, "Oh yeah, we're running three Wrestle Kingdom shows next year." <laughs> This is this is the future of New Japan Pro Wrestling. It's just every year we had another stadium show <laughs> with three thousand people in in attendance, lightly clapping. It's so, it, <laughs> while the same eight dudes wrestle each other. 
right? It's like that's the aspect of it that's so so depressing. <laughs> it's, it's so transparent what they're doing. It's exactly as you said, with limited capacity and what have you. They need to run big buildings multiple t- multiple times. But the problem is the product is becoming worse. The wrestlers are becoming more broken down. They can't get any of the American-based talent into the country. So it's the same, you know, Evil had another world title match this past weekend. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, man, I like your tweet that was like, the number of Wrestle Kingdom shows will continue to increase until morale improves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's sort of what it feels like. I mean, I really feel for the guys, because like you said, a lot of guys working very hard. Uh, Jeff Cobb went over Okada, so they're like, they're making a new guy um, yeah. kind of by, uh, by necessity, but they're doing it. But it's, it seems like every time they've made a new guy in the last year or so, whether that was Osprey, Shingo, now Jeff Cobb, uh, then another, another guy drops like, or, or yes. leaves the country <laughs> yes. and refuses to come back. <laughs> so yes. um, yeah, it's a, it's, it is a cursed promotion and uh, but we're just going to keep soldiering on and it's just all right. Hope we enjoy our, our, our Tokyo Dome main event part three, which I assume will be like Shingo Takagi versus Yoshihashi or something. May as well be at this point. May as well be at this point. All right. We've uh, covered the world. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? No, I think that uh, that about covers all of the the major uh, the major news and notes of the world. Oh, Mick Foley did a YouTube video. And WWE's mad about it, apparently. So that's that's fun. That's I like to relive the past every. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a vicious cycle, man. For you know, for twenty, for yeah, eighteen or twenty years, Mick, Mick gets mad at WWE, critical. right? Yeah, Mick criticizes WWE. WWE gets mad at Mick. Mick and WWE make up. Mick gets his feelings hurt. Again, I am very sympathetic towards Mick because he got hit in the head a lot for a living, and I always try to take that into consideration when I consider anything that Mick Foley or Bret Hart say publicly, or Mm -hmm. when they appear overly emotional in public. It's like, well, these guys got hit in the head a lot. Yes. So, uh, yeah, but, you know, Mick, really the biggest supporter of women's wrestling and is really into, let's see, who is he really into now? Ruby he Soho. Was, he was very excited about Ruby Soho's debut. Yeah. yeah. Um, I will say on a slightly more serious note, he did have a very nice post about Daphne. Um, um, but yeah, it's, it's Mick Foley. And as you said, there is a certain cycle to his behavior. Yes. Yeah, there certainly is. And he's got, you know, he's got some tickets to sell. He's uh he's touring the country, so he's uh doing shows with Ziggler. Ugh. What a duo. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Dolph Ziggler, there's a guy. Republican comedy, Republican bar <laughs> just Republican Ugh. bar stool comedy followed by grandpa head trauma (laughs) but by the way i'm pretty sure i've said this on this show i've definitely said it in private i am pretty sure i've said it on the show maybe only bonus features but literally my greatest fear in the entire world (laughs) was dolph ziggler and tony storm legitimately hooking up based on their love their shared love of motley crew and what are they doing on tv (laughs) They're teasing a Tony Storm Rick Boogs romance, but who should get his very high cheekbones in there? Dolph Ziggler. <laughs> it's well, my you know, worst. It's my worst nightmare. Oh no, it's coming <laughs> true. Uh, you have interesting nightmares, I would say. <laughs> and I, she's she's still dating uh, Juice Robinson, right? far as i know yes they have a dog okay. ralph robinson who i follow on instagram sure that's a normal thing to say and uh <laughs> at the very least juice is in the country and i assume lives with her so like you know 
I guess they are on tour a little more often now, but you know, I think it's less likely uh, than it could be if he were in Japan every week. You know, I'm just, I'm terrified. <laughs> it's my worst nightmare come true. <laughs> uh huh. All right. All right. Well, till next time, everybody. I'm very normal, <laughs> Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Oh, no. (laughs) There are just, there are some people that cannot say the word no. (laughs) Uh, I was like, I think uh, that's still my working theory for why she hasn't been on SmackDown since uh, since her debut week. Someone asked her a question within earshot of Kevin Dunn, <laughs> yes. and she answered no. Nah. Yes, and and now she will never be seen again. Yes, unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. I that's your theory. I went with the. Uh, I think they told her to lose weight theory. Um, I mean. Your track, the track record, the your theory has a, a probably more of a track record behind it. But I also know Bruce Pritchard and Vince McMahon, and I, was gonna uh, say, I know I know we've we've told male wrestlers to lose weight, but is it is it an era where you, yeah, ah, damn cancel culture gone awry? But can you even <laughs> can you even tell a, a very an objectively attractive woman that she would be more attractive if she lost weight anymore? <laughs> That was my thought. It was like, who has that conversation with her in 2021? Like, is it just Johnny Johnny Ace go up to her and have that conversation? Does Bruce <laughs> Pritchard do it? Do they have like an HR person that could do it? Like, no, I don't. It, yeah, and wasn't that kind of the thing? I forget if it's Gail Kim or somebody has the story of like it was like Johnny Ace or Jr. being like, we're not telling you to do this, right? But we are saying it wouldn't hurt if you did that. I think it was in revol- <laughs> I think it was in regards to like getting breast implants or something. But I see. I see. There's a story out there allegedly about that type of thing and how they went about telling women to do things. I see. I I would really enjoy interviewing Gail Kim, uh, Beth Phoenix, Jillian Hall, the women of that era of WWE, <laughs> just like ask, mm-hmm. asking them asking them questions about what what life was like. <laughs> God, yeah. <laughs> like you just think about how like unfair and weird life is for like actual famous like movie star women. Yes. When it comes to like what what is expected of them cosmetically, and you're like, yes. and imagine being in 2005 WWE. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where you yes. deal with that, and you deal with like Randy Orton shitting in your bag, and yes, and and then you know, implications being thrown your way by dirty old men. Like, yes. ugh, what a terrible place that must have been for any woman. Yes. I try to keep on keeping on.